Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So good afternoon, everyone. Happy Friday. I hope everyone's doing well today. Thank you so much for taking time out to join our echo session. So if this is not your first echo session with us, then this structure will look fairly familiar. Um, so all of our echo sessions are going to start out with announcements and introductions. Um, that'll be followed by a didactic session in which today's topic will be focusing on cognitive assessment, functional assessment, and dementia screening. And then uh, moving on into our collaborative case discussion, followed with closing and reminders. So to make sure the sessions run smoothly, please remember to mute yourself when you're not speaking to prevent background noise. Introduce yourself with your name and location prior to speaking. Um, please maintain confidentiality when speaking about your clients by refraining from including any identifying information and please respect others and their opinions. So we are CME accredited. Our main ob objective is to empower providers to feel capable and comfortable with the assessment and care planning for dementia and to expand access to geriatric specialty care throughout California and beyond. Today's session is accredited for one CME credit and I will be sending out a form after the session um, for everyone to fill out. Um, and then many other licensing boards like the California Board of Nursing also recognizes CME for reciprocity. So our series is a part of this HCBS Dementia Care Aware Award, which is supported by the California Department of Healthcare Services. And then one of the main goals for our grant is to create a dementia-friendly California for the population in need of equi equitable and excellent care, and to also train geriatric specialists, primary care providers, and health professional trainees and help expand our geriatrics workforce. So before we get started, um, we'd like to have everyone take the time to quickly introduce themselves on video, but since we have quite a few individuals, which is great, um, we'll go ahead and have everyone introduce themselves via the chat function if you can. So when introducing yourself, please list your name, role, site, and location. And in the meantime, we'll go ahead and have our hub team introduce themselves on video so you can get to know us and I'll get us started. So my name is Manahil Khan and I'm the project manager for our Dementia Care Aware Project at UC Irvine Health and we are located in Orange County, California. And I'll hand it off to Dr. Gibbs. Hi, Lisa Gibbs here. Great to see everyone here today. Thank you for joining us. So I'm the, the uh, Chief of Geriatrics at UC Irvine. Uh, and also the, the PI on the Dementia Care Aware, um, working uh, with UCSF, who is the core site. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gibbs. Dr. Sagal? Welcome, everybody. I'm, a, I'm Sonia Sagal. I'm a clinical professor in the Department of Medicine and the Division of Geriatric Medicine here at UC Irvine. Welcome, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Sagal. And Dr. Lee? Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Jung Ari. I'm associate professor in School of Nursing and working with uh, geriatric medicine. And, and my um, um, great passion is for dementia family caregivers education and support. Nice Thank you, Dr. You. Lee. Okay, so we will go ahead and get started with our presentation. And Dr. Gibbs, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you. Thank you for all joining us. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about functional assessment um, and how it relates to dementia and dementia screening. Okay, next slide, please. Oops, how did a baby get in here? Uh, well, as a matter of fact, um, geriatricians are absolutely obsessed with function. And uh, I put this baby in here uh, to illustrate that, you know, we look at function instead of chronological age most of the time. For instance, when you do see a baby, you know, you, you pretty much know what functional abilities and de developmental milestones you're working with um, for the most part. However, next slide, please. When we work with older adults, you know, we really don't. Uh, to us, you know, we, we in our senior health center see uh, people over 65 day in and day out. Uh, and I, I think for all of us, I can, I can say that we look at function. Sometimes we don't even know the age of our patients. So here, this uh, picture illustrates the fact that you have two, two gentlemen. Let's say they, they might both be in their 80s. Uh, however, one is uh, riding a bicycle through the streets and the other one is using a walker. Um, so their quality of life, their abilities um, are really based on their function and not on their age. And that's what we as geriatricians focus on. And that's why this talk is uh, so appropriate. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, function tells us a lot about someone's ability to be independent, uh, and our vision is to keep our patients and all older adults as independent as possible. Um, 
in association with their wishes, of course. It, it tells us a lot about their well-being. Are they able to, again, live independently? Are they able to um, satisfy all the social determinants of health that we'll speak about? And it really, really tells us a lot about their quality of life. Next slide, please. Now, we treat disease and medicine treats disease. And uh, sometimes we, we, you know, as we go through our training, we focus on disease processes. But once we, I think, mature, um, we understand that treating disease is really a means to an end. And the end ultimately is, is our patient's function, our patient's wishes, our patient's what matters most in an age-friendly health system. Hi, um, good afternoon, Mark. Hi, Juvie. How are you? I'm fine, how are you? So um, at any rate, so, so we understand that treating disease is, you know, ultimately it's a means uh, and the end is really how our patient is doing. What do they want to be doing in life? How are they aging? How can we help them age appropriately? Uh, and this, this directly speaks uh, to dementia as well. Next slide, please. So a couple of examples. Um, uh, I, <clears throat> I, I love art. Uh, so it's uh, normal for me to put these in, in uh, presentations. I believe many of you will recognize this as an early painting of Monet. Um, and I illustrate this with the next slide, um, showing that this is a much later painting, really of the same scene by Monet. Um, and in many cases, we can see that, you know, either his vision of his art, um, developed to the point where this was his vision, or it's also been rumored that potentially he suffered from eye disease. Um, and so really was this later vision of impressionism affected by what he saw or what he couldn't see? Uh, was it affected by purely his vision or absolutely concretely his vision? Um, so we can see that disability or function plays a big role in even historical artists. Okay, next slide, please. This picture is uh, from one of our medical students uh, who participated in a geriatric activity. And she was really struck as she followed a patient uh, through his primary care and through his specialists <clears throat> that, you know, at one point he needed some hand surgery. And she was struck by the fact that the surgeon spoke with the patient about what they were going to do in very technical terms, what was wrong, which nerves were affected, which tendons were affected, et cetera. But at the end of the visit, he left feeling, you know, like he hadn't had all of his answers, his questions answered. And ultimately, what he really wanted to know is, will I be able to play golf? Will I be able to play the piano? You know, like at the end of the day, what does this mean for me? And again, we will take this back to the detection and the, the care of uh, persons with dementia. So what really matters, again, at the end of the day is you know, what does it mean for our patients? Okay, next slide, please. So remember that dementia is really a concept. Dementia itself is not a disease, but it is a concept uh, for which we describe the imperative ability to remember, uh, to think well, or to make decisions that, um, that we need to be able to make. When we can't make these decisions, it interferes with our ability uh, on an everyday basis. And that's what we care about in terms of dementia. So ultimately, this, this dementia describes over 40 specific disease processes uh, that culminate in dysfunction. And oftentimes, we don't detect dementia early enough so that by the time we understand that there's a dementia process happening, dysfunction has already occurred. And sometimes it's the functional level that, that alerts us to the fact that something is really wrong cognitively. Next slide, please. Uh, and there are many, many instruments that we use to try to identify and describe and define what we're thinking about. Many of you have heard of the ADLs and IADLs, um, the activities of daily living um, and instrumental activities, which we will go over. There are other instruments that focus on social determinants of health that also enlighten us as to function. And some of the instruments are really tailored towards specific conditions, whether it's the ability to think, or the way that we move, um, uh, or maybe we have maybe, and there are other instruments for conditions like dysphagia or difficulty swallowing. 
Um, so we're going to go through a few of the instruments today uh, that really focus on detecting function um, as it relates to the presence of dementia. Next slide. Okay. Uh, now, it, as many of you are aware, this, this uh, program is part of Dementia Care Aware, which is a statewide initiative uh, to really um, encourage primary care physicians and, and other clinicians uh, to, to really detect to screen patients early on for the presence of cognition uh, problems. Uh, there is a website, which I encourage you all to take a look at. And this table is taken directly from that website. Um, so we are encouraging uh, the use of certain cognitive screening tests and functional screening tests through Dementia Care Aware. Um, and I'll point your attention here to the, the, the right-sided column. Um, one of them is looking at ADLs and IEDLs, um, and that would be specifically with a patient. Um, and other screening tests really involve informant or a support person or a person that knows that patient well enough to be able to answer certain questions. Okay, next slide, please. All right. Also want to talk about the 10 warning signs of Alzheimer's. So, um, and the and I'm going to talk about some of these as relate to function. Uh, the Alzheimer's Association uh, publishes these. You can see the reference there at the bottom. Uh, but again, number one, here we have it. Memory loss that disrupts late, daily life. But again, you know, if we could detect that dementia earlier before it disrupts daily life, that is our ultimate goal. And it's beneficial to patients and family and support uh, caregivers uh, in all. Okay, challenges in problem planning or solve, solving problems. Again, by the time you notice this, there is an issue with function. Difficulty completing familiar tasks, same thing. Um, number five, trouble understanding visual images and spatial relationships. Again, by the time this happens, there, may, there might be difficulties with driving, for instance. Uh, so a lot of these 10 warning signs are absolutely accurate and true. Uh, but again, we wanna try to get to the detection or the screening of dementia prior to having any daily dysfunction. Uh, and that's our ultimate goal. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's just review a couple of these screening tests. Um, again, this is from the Dementia Care Aware website. And I encourage all of you to take the training um, on the Dementia Care Aware website, uh, um, which uh, is extremely informative um, and very, very helpful. So activities of daily living, again, many of you have heard of these. Uh, I see these as, as all of the things that we probably do within the first 15 minutes of getting up in the morning, right? Bathing, dressing, transferring, grooming, toileting, having some breakfast. Uh, in terms of the instrumental activities of daily living, um, again, these are more outward facing, um, allowing us to communicate with our surroundings using the telephone, uh, preparing our meals, managing finances, taking medications, um, these are all the things I think of, you know, a college student learning once they're out and about and trying to live independently. So they're more complex. Okay, next slide, please. Um, this is an example of uh, what's called a social needs screener. This is something that we developed along with uh, the West Health Foundation based on social determinants of health. Uh, but through these questions, you can understand a lot about a person's function and what may or may not be working for them. Um, are you, so I won't go through all of these in detail, but just a couple of examples. Um, are you satisfied with the amount of social interactions you have every week? <clears throat> so if someone says no, you know, it could be that they've lost the ability uh, to, to reach out, maybe to use the telephone, to plan a gathering, um, <clears throat> or they may simply be isolated and possibly uh, depressed. Um, you know, a lot of these other ones, um, you know, housing instability. Are you worried about losing your housing? Okay, so there could be many reasons. Every time we find a, 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 an answer here that concerns us, then the next step is to say, well, why? You know, why? Why are you losing your housing? Why are you being evicted? Is it because you are no longer able to uh, manage your finances or pay your rent? Um, transportation needs, is there an issue there, right? Is that because you can no longer drive? Um, so a lot of the 
So this is really to point out that there's a there's a true integration between function and also social determinants of health. And once we have an issue with one, we usually have an issue with the other. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, and so this is the uh, the entire list, and um, I'll go ahead and move on. Next slide, please. Okay, this is another one, uh, and this is also encouraged uh, by our Dementia Care Aware program called the GP Cog Informant. Uh, this is instead of asking the patient directly. Uh, this is something where we would focus on the informant or the person who knows the patient well enough, at least, to be able to answer these questions. Um, this can be done on, on the computer. It's web-based. Uh, the time to administer this is only two minutes. There are only six questions, um, and, and it's uh, accessible in many, many languages. Okay, next slide, please. And these questions uh, really are focused on, you know, how the patient compared to the way they were five or 10 years ago. So does the patient have more trouble remembering things that have happened recently? Does he or she have more trouble recalling conversations a few days later? When speaking, does the patient have more difficulty in finding the right word or tend to use the wrong words more often? Uh, is the patient less able to manage money and financial affairs? And is the patient able to manage his or her medications independently? And these are really key questions. These are, you know, out of almost 20 years of practice, I think the ones that really pinpoint early problems with patients um, and, and they focus on the instrumental activities of late daily living for the most part, the ones that are more complex. And so this is more likely to pick up an earlier uh, problem with dementia. I mean, it can pick up later, obviously later progression, but it's sensitive to early problems. Next slide, please. Uh, there's also another one that we are encouraging through the Dementia Care Aware program. And again, all of this information is on the website, um, but this is called the Functional Activities Questionnaire. Um, it is not the frequently asked questions <laughs> that you say, but the Functional Activities Questionnaire. So again, this will focus on writing checks, paying bills, assembling tax records, shopping, you know, more complex um, activities that, that require us to use instrumental activities of daily living. And again, this is going to be uh, more sensitive for persons with early problems, which is which is really where we want to catch people as early as possible. So that's why these two are so important. Okay, next slide, please. Now, in terms of cognitive testing, um, we also um, encourage cognitive testing and well, screening early with some of the tests that um, are mentioned uh, on the website. Um, I wanted to point out the mini cog because it's just an illustration that uh, these screening questions also give us an idea of what may be going wrong. Okay, it's not just memory. We know that dementia is more than memory. Dementia is memory plus something else. And it's bad enough to cause problems with functional activities. Um, but if we look at the domains that are tested, and again, the mini cog for those of you uh, who'd like a refresher, uh, is that we ask patients to remember three words uh, and we ask them to draw a clock. Okay, two items. What can we really, really gain from asking people two items? Okay, well, actually, it's really impressive, but we can gain a lot. The domains tested are not only memory, but also visual spatial abilities, okay? And executive function, which, which, which covers planning, it covers multitasking, it covers the ability to, to sequence events. Um, so it's actually a very high level um, cognitive ability. Okay, so next slide, please. So if we look at these clocks, um, you know, this kind of illustrates what I'm speaking about. I mean, if you look at drawing a clock, putting it all the numbers in the right places, and then putting the hands at a specific time, um, and usually we say 10 after 11, although I think in this case, they, they think that uh, 9, 10 is the, the appropriate answer. Um, it takes quite a bit of planning. Um, it does take visual spatial abilities. It takes planning. And it also takes abstraction because if I'm asking somebody to, to give me the time at 10 after 11, 
they have to really think about the fact that that's 10 minutes after 11 o'clock. Uh, and oftentimes what people will do is they'll make it very concretely. They won't be able to abstract and they'll put one hand on the 10 and one hand on the 11. And then we know that there's an issue with abstraction. Uh, but if you see here, uh, this is an example of a clock that's being drawn um, over the progression of cognitive impairment. You'll see the normal, which is a score of 10, moving into mild cognitive impairment, um, where there's some error in the placement of the hands. Um, and then moving forward, you know, there's there, there, there's really an inability to even almost draw a circle, but even place the numbers correctly, much less understand how to how to put in the hands of the clock. And then finally, we get to severe cognitive impairment uh, at the end. So you can see not only progression, but you can understand that putting together a clock is really quite sophisticated uh, and gives us a lot of information in a really, really short period of time. OK, next slide, please. And again, we're back to art. Um, this is a, a German artist. His name is Uttermolen. OK, and a very fine artist. And you can see, I want you to just pay attention to this picture. Uh, we have a lot of fine details. We have shading. We have different colors. A lot of um, really fine, um, you know, fine details, such as the expression on, on this person's face. Actually, this is a self-portrait, um, you know, down to the little hairs on the, on the beard and um, and even the must-up hair in his head. So just a really fine portrait um, with a lot of detail. Now, unfortunately, Otermolin was eventually um, diagnosed with dementia. Uh, next slide, please. And as we, as we see his progression and his ability to, to make art um, along, along, we see that in this picture now, um, which is still pretty good, I mean, really, in terms of most of our abilities to draw art. Uh, but the fineness of the detail um, is not here, right? The shading of the really subtle colors are not here. Now we see really basic contrasting colors, um, a lot of lines, um, but very little fine, fine detail as we move forward. Um, and again, this was his next self-portrait. And next slide, please. And then as he moved into a more moderate, severe, dementia, um, he was not even really able to, to draw a figure appropriately. Um, there are no colors here. This is black and white. Uh, and his ability to even do the, the three-dimensional, the visual spatial placement um, is really not, not here at all anymore. Um, so again, this is just an example of the fact that his visual spatial abilities are very affected. Um, as well as, again, everything we talked about in terms of executive function planning and, and so forth. Um, so, you know, when we talk about function, it really is an eye into the world of the brain. Um, and our goal, again, with Dementia Care Aware is to really detect and screen for dementia before we have functional decline, because there's a lot we can do if we detect it early. Next slide, please. And this slide really, again, this is from the Dementia Care Aware website. Um, and this explains some of the benefits of early detection. Um, and these have a lot to do with function. Uh, so number one, improving the quality of life. Um, so people get to, you know, potentially remain independent uh, in their living situation for longer periods. If we can help them compensate, you know, um, eventually for some things that might be going wrong. Uh, we may be able to reduce unnecessary costs of care. If we can understand that somebody may be at risk for not taking their medications and we can compensate and help them out with that, they may continue to take the medicines they need to control their heart failure or their diabetes, and maybe they don't need to end up in the hospital. Okay, um, Increasing the likelihood of benefiting from evidence-based prevention strategies so certainly we're having more and more research come out that show that lifestyle changes are critically important uh, to not only preventing, but treating dementia. And, you know, 
the physical activity, the diet, uh, the social interaction. So if we know that somebody's starting to struggle or is at risk for starting to struggle, you know, we can be a lot more targeted in our medical care and in our other care in terms of getting this person the care that they need uh, to hopefully prevent or at least slow a, slow a cognitive problem down. Okay, and next slide, please. All right, and I just want to end. Um, you know, again, function is a geriatric issue. This is this is what we do. This is how we see the world. Um, and geriatrics for us is exciting. Um, and geriatrics never gets old. Okay, next slide, please. <laughs> That's good. All right, I think that's it. Um, Manahil, can you move forward? All right, so um, any questions I think might have been coming in, I can now check the chat, but um, we invite any and all questions. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Gibbs. So yes, if anyone does have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat. Um, can, there's one question, can family caregivers use all of these screening tools at home? Yes, I think, I think that could be a nice tool for family to maybe objectively take a look at what, you know, if you have concerns about, um, and, and a loved one's abilities, I think having a family member take a look and ask yourself some of these questions could be really helpful. Okay, well, we may have more questions. Oh, there's another question. Um, for new therapy to be tested, um, we need to screen much earlier than clinical screening, such as um, spinal, cerebral spinal fluid and imaging. So, you know, this is, this is where medical treatment is going. Um, once we become more sophisticated with imaging um, and, you know, determine, you know, what to look for in the cerebral spinal fluid, uh, I, I believe these procedures will happen more and more earlier and earlier so that when we do have some treatments available, uh, you know, people will understand. Um, and I think that'll be a huge boon to detecting dementia, by the way, because once there's a treatment, then people you will even uh, be more likely to want to be screened so they're about, they can avail themselves of the treatment. Um, but, um, but I don't, you know, so I think you're right. I think that medicine, medical care is getting there, but we still think that even without those things, um, early detection just based on a clinical interview is absolutely critical to the, the health and well being of our patients. Um, Ron, can we, oh, thank you, Ron. Can we get a copy of the slides? Yes. Um, and let's see if there's any other questions. What do you think of spec scans? And, and treatment. So again, you know, we have hope that some of these treatments coming down, um, you know, coming down in the clinical trials are going to bear out. Um, but I think in the short term, they're going to be extremely expensive. They may not be the silver bullet we're looking for. Um, and right now, spec scans and so forth are not going to be the standard of care uh, for treatment, um, probably more for research. Okay. And okay, that's the I think that's it for questions right I now. I think we have one more question from Linda King. Oh, oh when do you? Oh, that's for you, Manahil. Yeah. I actually have you, a question regarding function, Dr. Gibbs. Oh, where? I, I, it's for me. It's for me. You have a question? Yes, I, I have a question. I wonder if you could just speak for a few minutes on how function, <laughs> um, can be a predictor of um, like future care needs, such as placement, for example, um, how, how function yeah. uh, impacts one's ability to, to be safely at home versus institutionalized. Um. Right, right. So I think you're speaking about like the benefit of, of screening and diagnosing dementia so that we can we can follow patients functions because when we can do that we can understand if they can live home live at home safely um 
And when we follow function, we can understand when people do need to make the transitions from independent living to perhaps them living at home with some care caregiving, then perhaps to, you know, if needed to assisted living, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really important for us to understand function and to follow it over time so that we can help our patients make those transitions and inform family members um, who may not, real, not really understand what's coming next or what to look for. Thank you, Dr. Gibbs. We do have a few more questions in the chat um, and I'll read them to you. So if, a pa if patients are diagnosed with early cognitive impairment, what are the available treatment management uh, strategies and what to look forward in the near future? Okay, so early cognitive impairment. So first of all, we mentioned, you know, lifestyle changes. Um, to the extent that a lot of cognitive impairment may or may, or may not have a vascular component, um, cause we, we know that there are some dementias that are purely Alzheimer's, some are purely vascular, but many, many are mixed. Uh, but even so, no matter what, what, which type it is, we're finding out that lifestyle is critically important. We're finding out some great research on diets like the mind diet or even the Mediterranean diet, um, is beneficial for brain health. Um, certainly, there's some research coming out, I think, from Japan now, talking about the fact that if somebody can get so many steps, like 10,000 steps a day, they're less likely to either uh, develop dementia or have their dementia develop uh, as much as someone who doesn't have any activity per day. So activity and, and diet are extremely beneficial uh, for brain health as well as just keeping your mind active and remaining social. There are a couple of medications on the market. They've been on the market for quite some time. Um, Denepazil uh, and Memetine, which we, which we also at least offer to patients. You know, again, they're not a silver bullet um, and we offer them uh, because we have them, but because patients and families are looking for whatever they can use uh, for their loved one. And in some cases, we find that there might be some noticeable improvement, but in many cases, we don't notice uh, much at all. So we feel like lifestyle changes are just as, if not more important than the medications that are out currently. Uh, there's a lot more in the news, though, about, you know, others coming um, down through the clinical trials again. So we'll need to see in the next probably five years if we're going to have something that works much more effectively. Thank you. Next question is, how do you perceive if social determinants of health are positive? So I think that's, uh, you know, different for each system and each clinical practice. Uh, here at UCI, we, we do the social needs screening as part of our annual wellness visit. And if we have a positive response, we have the ability to, to um, then refer our patients to a social worker or to a health coach. Or we actually have built in the ability to refer them directly to our Alzheimer's, um, our, our local Alzheimer's um, OC. Um, so I think every system can, can figure out what works best for them given the resources that they have. Um, uh, but certainly um, once we find a significant problem with the social determinants of health, we know that eventually it will impact the healthcare. So it's really, really important to address that. Thank you. One additional question from the chat. Uh, what do you think of community-based uh, adult services? Uh, we love them. Um, I don't know which, which one you may be speaking of, but at least here in Orange County, um, and they offer, you know, amazingly valuable uh, social interaction. Um, now, cognitive stimulation, uh, we feel they're absolutely essential for the health of people that are struggling from cognitive issues. Okay. Next question. Um, what are your suggestions for family members that are in denial of a spouse's decline and ability to recover? Yeah, that can be really difficult. Um, and sometimes it's not, you know, the spouse, but it's the patient themselves. Um, so, you know, I guess, you know, we would, we would have a, an honest conversation, um, probably 
you know, I like to focus on what what someone was able to do before and what they're able to do now and then ask, well, why are they not able to, to do it as they did before? Um, I would focus on any safety issues, maybe caregiver stress that the spouse didn't realize they were under. Um, but that's, you know, that's the whole beauty of a, a continuity relationship with our patients is once we can start have those conversations because then they start to trust the healthcare provider. Um, and over time, then eventually you can get to that point in a non-threatening uh, manner. So I hope I answered that question. Thank you, Dr. Gibbs. Next question. Is assessment and monitoring of cognition and function part of primary care visits for older adults? Wow, that's a great question. I feel like that was planted here. Um, absolutely. Um, absolutely. And especially in our practice here, where we see people over 65, this is something that, that are, that's always on our minds. Um, again, we, we have a focus on annual wellness visits, which has a very, very brief cognitive screen, as well as our social needs functional screener. Um, and we, we feel like it's absolutely essential. When it is part of primary care, we're more likely, again, to do the screening, uh, to have the early detection, uh, and we're more, more able to improve the health of our patients. So yes, thank you for that question. All right, next question is from Arden Kwan, uh, who states, we have been focusing on diagnosing distinct diseases such as AD, DLB, and FTLD, et cetera, but with high prevalence of mixed syndromes, uh, we may need to focus on function or pathologic pathways instead. Yes, absolutely true. Yes. I mean, I think it's helpful to understand as much as we can to get a uh, accurate diagnosis on the type of dementia. But at the end of the day, you know, uh, as I was saying before, all roads end to end into function, the functional category, you know, what care does somebody need? What can they do for themselves? What brings them joy? Um, how does this affect their quality of life? So yes, absolutely. Um, good, good observation. Okay. And then uh, next a follow up from uh, Arden Kwan. Would two mm -hmm. new antibodies for amyloid in the brain approved by the FDA? Mm -hmm. How will this change dementia care and follow up? Well, you know, again, I think this will take a while to filter down to standard or standard practice. If it does, um, they're not ready. These won't. These probably won't be readily available to to most of us for a while. And you know. Some of the sometimes when these new treatments come out, the cost is very prohibitive as well. Um, so it's, I think that remains to be seen. And sometimes when we think something looks really promising in a clinical trial, sometimes we find out that it's really not, you know, what it seemed to be. Um, so yeah, I think we won't, we will, we'll all need to wait for those answers. Thank you. Another question. Do you find patients uh, open to dementia screening? I think it depends on how you approach it. Um, you know, I think that letting patients know that there's a real benefit to being screened early is important because we're able to keep them healthier longer. We're able to provide the means for them to live independently longer. And so I think we have to promote the role of positive aspects of screening. Um, in, in our practices, you know, again, where we have established primary care, um, I find very little resistance uh, to patients when we want to do a brief cognitive screen. Um, I think that sometimes you'll find resistance when people are afraid afraid of potentially like losing their license. I mean, that that can be an issue, but I think that there'll be less resistance if we can, again, screen very, very early before people ever get to that point. Thank you, Dr. Gibbs. Those are our questions from the chat. Great questions. Okay. So thank you, Dr. Gibbs, for your presentation. And thank you, everyone, for your questions. So now we're going to move into our case presentation. Um, so we'd like this to be as collaborative as possible. And then, you know, we'd love participation from the crowd as well. So the floor is yours, Dr. Gibbs and Dr. Sagal. 
Thank you. And Dr. Sagal, I'll um, turn this over to you to get started. Thank you, Dr. Gibbs. Uh, next slide, please. Do you have the slides, Manahil? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, my computer is glitching. Give me one second. Oh, we have a great group here today. Yes, thank you. Those were, those were wonderful questions. Um, while we're just getting our technical issues sorted out, anyone have any questions that they would like um, to pose or, or any other thoughts regarding function and cognitive impairment? If you think of any, please don't hesitate to add them to the chat. Um, I'll quickly present um, a patient from our own uh, clinic at the Senior Health Center. So um, just some background. So we have a 76-year-old female that came in uh, with her son and daughter. She had a past medical history of right knee osteoarthritis and hypertension. And she presented with a two-year history of slow and progressive short-term memory loss. When she initially presented to our clinic, she was forgetting to take medications consistently, um, although her family reported that she was 90% accurate, uh, so there's a 10% error rate there. She was forgetting details of her medical visits and social events, and family would ask her uh, what she had done or what the physician would say during visits, and she had vague responses. And the family didn't think much of that because they state that she was never really good with details and that she did not have a medical background uh, and they didn't expect her to recall um, those kinds of, um, that kind of information. Mm -hmm. She was able to perform the activities of daily living without assistance. And um, the patient reported that she was independent with instrumental activities of daily living and the family agreed. Um, and the family felt that her cognitive changes were consistent with the normal aging process. Next slide. But again, this is really, this is, this is a wonderful case, I think, because really we don't see much cognitive decline here yet. It's really more of a reported subjective feeling that there's a memory issue. And um, just kind of thinking back on her initial presentation, she was living uh, independently in her own home. She did uh, have a longtime housekeeper that the family had hired for a few additional hours per week to assist, mainly because they were concerned about her knee arthritis and her ability to, um, to ambulate uh, long distances without getting into some trouble and experiencing pain. She was then seen two years later, and they came back for an evaluation of um, a pre-op optimization visit for a right total knee um, surgery that she was about to engage in. And the family reported that the patient now had a care attendant in the day uh, due to problems with mobility that her memory changes had gradually worsened. She was having uh, more repetitive questioning, trouble managing her medications uh, reliably most of the time. Family was now managing finances. And the family was frustrated because they were not able to find what they thought were reliable caregivers. And they had actually gone through five sets of caregivers um, and the patient was reporting to the family that the caregiver, that every caregiver that would come into the home was um, stealing from her, um, not allowing her to be as independent as she would like to be and leaving the home. Uh, uh, she would wanted to leave the home unattended and they wouldn't let her and felt that the caregivers were demanding of her and um, kind of tattling on her to the family. And the family really did believe what the patient was saying. They, they felt that the caregivers were truly stealing and were truly um, disrupting her, her situation. Yeah. The caregivers reported that the patient was not able to manage her activities of daily living safely. Um, and the family perceived that to be um, due to the caregivers wanting more hours of work for their own financial gain. Okay. Yeah, and again, I think there's an opportunity between 
in the last prior two years to have followed this patient more closely for this type of decline. You know, rather than getting to the point where now they've already been through five sets of caregivers and everyone's pretty much really confused at this point. And I will say that this patient's um, uh, children were in the medical profession. So um, her son uh, is a physician and daughter um, was in education. So there was some familiarity with uh, health, although not directly with primary care and um, or geriatrics. Um, next slide, please. So the family was feeling that cognitive changes were, they eat, despite the fact that they had progressed, were continuing, um, they, they continued to be in the normal aging uh, process. They were frustrated with the caregiver situation, did not recognize that mom's care needs had grown over the past two years. And, um, they felt that the patient was able to be more independent than the caregivers were allowing her to be. And interestingly, this it was really pushing for this total knee surgery um, because they felt that once she was able to be more mobile and ambulate independently and get her pain under control, that she would have less need for caregivers. Okay. And that sort of headache for them would, um, uh, would res be resolved. And, you know, I think the, the, the screening, the screenings, either the GP cog or the, or the functional assessment questionnaire, you know, as simple as they are, produce some objectivity, right? I mean, this is a family who's very educated, even in medicine. However, they really don't see clearly what's happening. Um, so it just goes to show you that, that these screening tests can be important, you know, even more important for people that have lost that sort of ob objectivity. Next slide, please. So, you know, she was lost to follow up. She didn't come back for a number of years. And, and obviously, she is cognitively impaired or mini cog uh, demonstrated her cognitive um, uh, decline. And um, in terms of uh, what was happening with this patient, I think it's pretty obvious that you know, her, her slow and progressive decline truly was related to a dementing illness, um, neurodegenerative process, and um, that had just slowly worsened. Next slide, please. So how would an earlier diagnosis of cognitive impairment have helped this patient, um, not just from a future planning, but functional standpoint as well? And I, I open this up for conversation with our audience. You're muted, Dr. Gibbs. Well, you're all thinking about that. Uh, <laughs> there was a comment here from Barbara McClendon at Alzheimer's LA that the case really speaks to the need for quality dementia care training for paid caregivers. Absolutely, absolutely. And they, they know more about this patient than really the family does at this point. Absolutely. Any thoughts about how we could have made a difference in this woman's life um, had an earlier diagnosis been made? Was the family informed of the um, objective data of impairment? Yes, they attended the visit um, at the two-year mark, um, and they were informed, they were actually present okay. um, when the mini cog was administered. And in that, it, in light of that, they still um, believe that um, the older adult could live independently and was Okay. You know, interestingly, they did. I, I think they, um, and, you know, sometimes we see this with patients who admit, have advanced cognitive uh, loss. You know, they, she was very convincing in how she spoke. She uh, pulled at their heartstrings and, you know, they weren't with her on a day-to-day -day basis. So she lived um, in one part of Southern California, her 
um, son lived about 90 miles away and her daughter was about 40 miles away. So they weren't seeing her every day and they were really relying on these caregivers who for some reason they didn't um, wholeheartedly trust. And it was a process for them to, to, to be able to understand that this is clearly not normal and not safe. Right. And this is part of the whole dementia care aware program is, is to, is to break down these barriers of not wanting to see, because if, if we can really show people that it's better to know, it's better to, to not be in denial and it's better to, we'll be able to help people and help families a lot more uh, the sooner we really understand and accept what's going on. But that's part of the work here, right, is to sort of break down those barriers of denial. Yeah, and I think for for these, and, and it wasn't that the, the children were, were not attentive or they were not disinterested, they loved their mother, they wanted the best for her. But I do think at some level, you know, when you open that can of worms, so to speak, about, you know, as your loved one, you know, are they demented or do they have this process, you know, it then opens up a whole other set of responsibility that they need to take on and they needed to be in the correct space um, to accept that. Right. And it's also important for the medical system um, to be working closely with the community network to be able to say, you know, here, this is how, this is how we can help. This is how you can help your mom. Um, so there's, there's some nice answers coming in here. Um, uh, Human Tabarsi says earlier, earlier detection would help with planning ahead and reaching out for proper support system. Um, and again, Cheryl Brunk, so similar opportunity to know the resources in the community to, to provide education for families and caregivers. Um, and um, and Linda King says the first step would be to develop a relationship so the patient and family would be willing to accept help. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And just to answer um, the qu uh, question about where the spouse was, the spouse um, had passed away a number of years prior. I just have a comment on Valerie George. I'm a PA, I work with a senior health center here. Um, I think, thank you. Um, I think that sometimes these patients um, come to us and maybe also present to their families as, um, looking as though everything is normal. And they kind of tell these little um, ways to get around things. Uh, sometimes they give brief answers or things like that, but they may have a positive attitude and things look like they're in place. But as we get to know them, I think on our our side, we can see that there is some slippage. And and I think it's true uh, with uh, this case, perhaps that the family um, may have been in a denial because um, it's hard to accept that your parent is uh, declining or having memory changes when you know them a certain way. And if they're holding on their own, the house is okay, things are okay, then it may not be as, um, as pre prevalent as until you start to really go into the cognitive testing. And um, so I think that that, I've come across this type of patient before and and um, it's always kind of a surprise and there is some denial in there, but then once it gets going, then there's also almost a, um, a feeling of, um, not grief, but there's a feeling of realization of now things are changed and there becomes more stress with that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Valerie. And sometimes relief too, because um, because maybe somebody kind of knows inside that something's not quite right, and then once you're able to face it, there's a sense of relief. Although uh, relief can coexist with the stress. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we're getting to the top of the hour. Um, and Mark Odom. Oftentimes, dementia-focused community-based providers can spend more time listening and supporting. Absolutely, that that referral to the community network, especially our Alzheimer's um, uh, Alzheimer's Association and Alzheimer's OC in LA, critically important. Um, and the support groups and and the warm lines and all of that is so important for people who have been there. Um, and can really advise them in ways that sometimes our, our, our healthcare providers cannot. 
Absolutely. Um, just really briefly, I'll just review a few points. I think you guys have touched on a number of these. But in terms of early detection, obviously, we want to know the patient's voice when they are able to share that with us. Um, so early detection will allow us to understand what mattered to her, um, be able to discuss advanced directives, uh, such as a pulse form, and really maybe explore a personal narrative for family history preservation. You know, so many details are lost as people, people um, advance in their cognitive decline. Um, it also would have allowed for education about progression, symptoms, stages, and function for the family so they could come to terms in a much more um, slow and coordinated fashion. Uh, they would be able to learn communication strategies, understand what is normal and not normal uh, in regard to cognitive changes, and um, learn to work with caregivers. And then from a medical more standpoint, also to avoid medications that might negatively be impacting cognition and really reevaluate surgical intervention for her knee arthritis. I mean, this was a woman who was presenting with a moderate dementia, um, frankly, and you know the risk for her to undergo anesthetic and her potential for recovery after knee replacement was a big concern for the medical team. And um, that needed to be understood by the family. So, and, and look at alternative options for pain management. Um, and then of course, you know, discussion about early administration of some of the medications that are approved uh, for Alzheimer's disease. So um, lots of benefit for early intervention and education. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gibbs and Dr. Sagal. So just some closing and reminders before we end this out. If you do wish to receive CMEs, please fill out the form at the following link, or you can scan the QR codes. Um, we also ask that you complete the evaluation form as this really helps us with our continuous quality improvement efforts. Um, and I will be emailing this presentation and the links that are present um, in a follow-up email before the end of the day. But I also want to say, please join us next Friday, December 9th, for session four of our ECHO series. I'll be sending out a Zoom invite at the beginning of next week with more information. And thank you again for your time. And we really hope to see you on Friday, December 9th, for our session on cognitive assessment, risk factors for cognitive impairment, and how to modify them. So thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.